Managing Violence Podcast, episode 81. We're talking to martial arts legend Eddie Quinn about how a near-death experience being stabbed led him to, into martial arts and a career in self-protection. He's a lovely guy, and you're going to enjoy this interview. Check it out. The Managing Violence Podcast is proud to be partnered with Fuji Sports. Fuji Sports manufactures the highest quality of judo, jiu-jitsu, and MMA gear. Everything from geese to rashies, shorts, gloves, pads, bags, mats, finger tape, everything you could possibly need for training. I've personally been a customer and supporter of Fuji Sports dating back to my very first BJJ gi in 2007. Since then, they've been a go-to brand for me, whether I was chasing judo gear, BJJ gear, MMA gear, or just convenient bags to carry everything around in. The gear I wear to Krav Maga training now is actually a Fuji Sakai. Uh, it's one of the most comfortable and most durable gears I've ever owned. And yes, they even come in black for the ninjas in the audience. As a listener of the show, simply enter the discount code MVP10 at checkout for 10% off your order, and a percentage of the sale will also go to the show to keep us on the air. Savings for you, commission for us. What's not to love about that? Uh, MVP10 for 10% off at fujisports.com or fujisports.com.au for the Aussies. Some exclusions apply. Thank you, Fuji Sports, for years of high-quality gear and for supporting the show. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Managing Violence podcast. I'm joined today by Mr. Eddie Quinn. But before we do that, we need to say a quick thank you to Fuji Sports, as you just heard, put in MVP10 in your coupon code at checkout and uh, you will get 10% off. And they will also give a kickback to the podcast. It's a, it's a hell of a deal. Savings for you and uh, a little bit of a a bit of influx for us, which is always always lovely. Thank you very much to our friends at Fuji Sports. Uh, also, uh, please make sure you check out our brand new website. That's right, I've been working behind the scenes on a new website, violencepotter.com, same address, different website. Go check it out, let me know what you think. Uh, check out our merchandise, check out all the, the back catalog. We are growing that back catalog, man. We are now up to 81 episodes as of today. It's a lot of content. That's a uh, it's, uh, I think, well over 150 hours now of content. If you include the bonus content, it gets even even more ridiculous. It's a lot going on. So make sure you check out that website. And if you do want bonus content from this episode and every episode we've done since season four, so it's over 50 episodes now, uh, then make sure you check out patreon.com forward slash managing violence for as little as five bucks a month. You can get access to bonus content from all our guests. And if you want to spend a little bit more, you'll even get uh, coaching from me, free webinars, exclusive webinars, and uh, and even one-on-one -on -one coaching calls all available at our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash managing violence. And speaking of our Patreon, I need to give a shout out to three new members. We have Mr. Jason Schultz, Mr. Brett McKenzie, and Mr. Russ Anderson. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your contributions. They've all qualified to join the Tribal Elders, which means they'll get all the bonus content as well as exclusive webinars, uh, which is a pretty good deal, if you ask me. <laughs> Although, you would, if you ask me, I would say that, wouldn't I? I'm trying to get you to do it. Ten bucks a month, not a bad deal. All right. <laughs> Uh, thank you also very much to uh, Tino, listener of the show, who left a really lovely review of my book, Neon Jungle, A Bounces, True Tales of Lessons, Laughs and Lacerations on Amazon. But uh, all right, this, is, this podcast isn't really about me. It's about Mr. Eddie Quinn. Eddie is a martial arts legend, uh, most famous in the Muay Thai and Salat circles, but also very well known for his uh, self-protection system, The Approach. We will talk about the origin of that system, about Eddie's journey through the martial arts, and a lot about what makes a great instructor, because Eddie is well-renowned uh, world renowned uh, as a fantastic instructor, uh, someone who really gets the art of teaching and making martial arts, making self protection fun and palatable and enjoyable. And uh, I pick his brain about that as well. So without further ado, here he is Mr. Eddie Quinn. All right, I'm joined here on the Managing Violence podcast by the one and only Eddie Quinn. Eddie, thank you for joining us. Thank you very much for inviting me, Joe. I'm very humbled to be asked to come on the show. Mate, you've been uh, you've been recommended for uh, se several several years now. I think uh, that, that your name has come up periodically, not only from the UK but also from from guests from around the world that have said oh, you need to get Eddie Quinn on, and uh, we fi finally made to make it happen. So uh, so welcome. It's uh, thank you. Long over very much. <laughs> I did actually feel like it was I was had a touch of imposter syndrome when I uh, read your Facebook message to say would you like to join the show because I thought all these top guests that you've had on, 
<laughs> and uh, I didn't re- I didn't really feel worthy if I'm honest with you. And then I, I saw the, the title of your show, Manage, Managing Violence. And um, I, I think I've uh, managed violence very well over the past 35, 36 years of, uh, especially from what happened to me. So yeah, yeah. thank you very much for, for having me. Yeah, man. Uh, look, uh, it's it's an absolute pleasure, uh, and uh, and as you said, I mean, the, the topic of the show is managing violence. It's not about any one aspect. It's it's just about how, how do we manage violence in society? How do we prevent it? How do we pre- prepare for it? How do we respond to it? How do we recover from it? Uh, and and everything in between, really. Uh, and that's it's kind of just a, it's a weird thing to be passionate about. But here we are. Uh, yeah. So, mate, let's let's just start at the beginning. Uh, for for those that don't know you, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a bit of an intro in the in, in the, uh, the the intro to the show, uh, but you, you're, you're a well-known coach, you're the founder of The Approach, but t- tell, tell us the, the story. How, how does Eddie Quinn get into martial arts and how, how does this all unfold for you? Well, it all started on a Friday evening uh, on the 23rd of November, 1984. Uh, and I was drinking in my local pub, which was literally a five minute walk from my house. And it was about 11, about 10, about 10.45. And one of my friends ran into the pub and said that my girlfriend was being attacked at the bus stop across the road. And I was drinking with one of my friends and we ran out. It was an ex-girlfriend. And uh, we ran across the road to the bus stop. And there was uh, three guys and there was three girls. And uh, two of the lads got involved. One pulled out. It was a big lad. And he pulled out a sock with either pool balls or snooker balls or, or rocks in. And there's a tall, thin guy in front of me. And he pulled out a flick knife on me. And, you know, me being 18, just lost my father anyway. Um, fueled with a, several pints of, would you believe, Castlemaine 4X. I don't know if they still do that in Australia now. And hey, uh, hey, I'll, I'll, I will not have anyone just uh, the name of 4X on this show. <laughs> and there was no way I was going to back down. I, was, I said, what, you know, what are you picking on the girls for, mate? What's the, what's, the, what's the crack? And then suddenly the big guy, he went steaming into my mate. And um, the, the, the tall guy with the knife, he just lunged at me with a blade. Uh, obviously, I didn't think he was going to use it, um, but it all kicked off and I knew I'd been stabbed and I was hitting him and he was stabbing me. And it, it felt like it was going on for, for, for hours, if I'm honest with you. And um, I remember being pinned against the railings of the, um, by the bus stop and he was sticking the knife into me. And um, Alfie came running over, my mate came running over and I went, no, Alfie's got a blade. And the guy looked at Alfie and he just ran. And uh, I remember like standing there and I'd, it was back in the old, I mean, you're talking 84, so, you know, you're looking at the old two-tone days of Madness and Selector and, you know, the specials and I had my Ben Sherman shirt on and my two-tone trousers and my brogues and, you know, and uh, I looked down at my shirt and I was pissing my blood and uh, the, the, the people started spilling out of the pub and uh, the, the doorman, I was quite well known in the area right? because I lived there and the doorman came out, the head doorman came out and he laid me down. And I remember looking up at the stars on that Friday night and thinking, fuck, is this it? And I, I, I mean, I've, I've mentioned this quite a few times in various seminars and podcasts and things. But the most scariest feeling was not just the blood. It was just my, how my breathing had changed. Because I didn't feel any pain from, from the knife. Um, but the way that the, the breath had changed, that was like, Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm, I'm dying. And um, I was taken to hospital. The crash team were waiting for me. They were cutting my clothes off. I was, I was, I was in and out of consciousness. All I could remember is people saying, Eddie, don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. Don't go to sleep. And I can say that I'm, I was conscious the whole time. I've looked at my medical records since, and they said that I was in and out of consciousness. Uh, but I remember my clothes being cut off. I remember the doctors standing over me. I remember them getting me ready. I had tubes being inserted into my body while I was still conscious. And the doctor stood over me and he put his finger on my top of my chest and he went, 
we're going to open him from there to there. And that was the last thing I remember. Um, I got stabbed in my right ventricle in my heart, my liver, my bowel, my gallbladder, my head, and my thigh were all punctured in the attack. I mean, I found my medical records today, so because I knew what was coming on. It also said that I had a hematoma of my left lung, I had a, a hematoma in my um, transverse mesocolon, and some other hemorrhage. So I'm a very lucky man. Absolutely. That's, that's some catastrophic injuries. Yeah, 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 I mean, you can see. So there's the, there's the, the puncture wounds here. There's where they zipped me up from the top to bottom. And uh, in, in quite a strange, perverse kind of way, it was probably one of the best things that's ever happened to me. Yeah, so, so talk us through that. I mean, it, it, you've, uh, obviously you've got, you've got a pretty good recollection of events up until that point. What was it like waking up? Um, oh, waking uh, up. The pain was horrendous. I remember my whole body was just strapped up. And I remember, and they were trying to move me, and I was in the most horrendous pain. I can, I can still kind of like feel it now. It was the most horrendous pain of, 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 of waking up after operation. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd stopped breathing numerous times. It was the medical record said that after extensive resuscitation, I was handed over to the thoracic surgeons who saved my life. Um, but strangely enough, I was, I was only in hospital for less than two weeks. Doctor said that, um, that I was young enough, strong enough to carry on with my life. And that was it. Left. What sort, Left. Of, impact, what sort of impact does that have on you psychologically as an 18-year-old who's had... Well, dad had, just, but dad had just died. Dad had just died in the May. Uh, I got two older sisters. I was a mistake. I was a result of a trip to Ireland to go visit my dad's family. Um, and so, there, you know, there was 10 years between me and my sister. So, like, dad had died and my two sisters, um, again, they weren't living at home. So my mom was on, my, on her own with just me and her. And, um, yeah, it was, it was horrendous because it was just like, a, I became like a, just a, like a bit of a, I wouldn't say a basket case, but I was, I've never been the most confident kid. I got, as, as a child, I used to get bullied. I was a mother child. Simple fact was I was, a, you know, as I say, I was a mistake. Mom had two daughters and then suddenly having a son, you know, I was really mothered and spoilt. Um, so, you know, it, it, it was, um, it was just a very, very weird time because my body was coming down with every infection known, known to man afterwards. I was even getting like chicken pox, had pneumonia, had pleurisy. I was drinking a lot more. I was feeling sorry for myself. I was eating shit. And, you know, it, it wasn't the best time with dad dying and then that happening to me. It wasn't a great time in my family. And then, the, you know, the, the 1985 was just a year that I was just you know, fr afraid of my own shadow, really. And I had to go and see a heart specialist. Um, and his name is Mr. Abrahams. So I was 19 at the time. He must have been in his 60s at that time. So bless him, you know, he'd be, he'd be kicking up the daisies by now. And he said to me, he said, son, have you ever thought about taking up a combat sport? There's no offer of any kind of like... Uh, therapy or anything like that it was you said have you ever thought about taking a combat sport and I went doc I've thought about it and he went son I suggest you go and do it and that was a, I've sent, sent me cold now but that was a that was a massive turning point in my life where I took the doctor's advice you know you're talking 1985 so it's pre-internet so there was no information I knew nothing about martial arts all I wanted to do was go and get pissed with the lads you know, have a good play up with the girls and, you know, go to work. Um, I had no inclination to train in martial arts. I didn't think I needed to be, to, to train martial arts. It didn't, you know, the idea didn't come into my head one bit. And um, my best mate at work, Stevie, he, he had a, a friend whose mate taught 
I don't know, I think it was Japanese jiu-jitsu or something. We didn't know what it was. It could have been, you know, karate, it could have been judo, because, you know, we didn't know anything, you know. I'd heard about judo, I'd heard about karate, I'd heard about kung fu, but that was pretty much it in those days. And um, we went to the local sports centre, probably about three or four miles away from where we lived. Walked into this room, saw these guys in white suits, throwing each other about. And from that minute, from that second walking in there, I was like, I need this. And um, I, introduced, I introduced myself to Steve, my good sh uh, shout out to Steve Maycock, my first teacher. He's still around, he's teaching Krav Maga now. Um, he was there and I uh, introduced myself and um, he said he could help me. And that's when the journey started. It was around 19. It was either the end of 85 or the beginning of 1986. And that's how it all started. So we've, uh, you, you found your way into martial arts. And uh, it's, uh, what was the impact on that from, in terms of your confidence? I mean, how long did it take to really get your feet under you and feel confident in that sort of environment? Yeah, well, years. I've been training for five, six years, and I was still scared. I mean, the great thing was that, like I said to you, my diet was bad. I was drinking a lot. I was feeling sorry for myself and it, it actually gave me something to focus on. And I was about, I mean, I'm five foot 10 when I stand up straight. So I'm not the most tallest, but I was over about 15 stone in them days as a 19 year old. And it wasn't a, a good 15 stone. It was, it was a fat 15 stone. And I'd really got the martial arts bug and I was training, you know, every day because I work with Stevie as well. So, we we'd attend like Steve's uh, uh, Steve Maycock's Jiu Jitsu class three times a week, but then we'd be training at work in the lunch hour and stuff like that. And um, within I don't know within six months or so, I'd, I'd lost four stone in weight, so I went from like fifteen stone to a really fit eleven stone. And it was it was great. I was I, I was becoming more confident in myself, but I was still very very scared. And again, I mean, this was like, like I said, this was 85, 86, 87. Um, once I'd started martial arts, it was like I became obsessed. And I was like cross training before it became cross training. Um, because, you know, I had two jiu jitsu teachers, Japanese jiu jitsu teachers. There was Steve who we are friends now, but he was my teacher. And I had another guy, Jimmy, who was a black belt and we were, we were good mates. Um, but, you know, when I, I started to cross train, uh, bro, I, you know, I was too scared to even tell Jimmy I was cross training because it wasn't the thing to do back in the day. I wanted to turn myself into this all round martial artist that could fight, stood up on the ground with a weapon, without a weapon. Um, I'm not knocking it, but jiu-jitsu, Japanese jiu-jitsu didn't give me that. I learned how to throw, I learned how to apply a wrist lock. But I'm a kid from the streets. And I'd seen a lot of violence growing up. And been in quite a few scrapes as well growing up. And I just realized that lots of the things that they were teaching just would not work in the street. And I was still scared of knives. Um, so I started to like, I started to buy like all the, you, you know, Geeko, you got Simat Geeko. There used to be a Geeko shop, the first Geeko shop around the corner from where Stevie and I worked. And I used to go there and buy all the books and all the magazines, and I used to start researching stuff. And, you know, like Danny Nasanto used to say that, you know, the, 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 the weapon arts were like uh, Filipino martial arts and Silat. Uh, and, you know, if you want a great base in striking for Muay Thai because they're fit, they used to get in hit, they do standing clinch, they hit hard. So I was like, I wanted, wanted to learn Muay Thai. I didn't want to go into any of the Japanese karate styles. I kept on reading all about flow and how the Southeast Asian arts uh, were, mo were more fluid. And there was something about the Southeast Asian arts, even though I was studying a Japanese art, 
there was something about those arts that fascinated me. And um, I was looking for a Thai boxing coach, even though I'm, I, I'm from Birmingham, which is the second biggest city in, you know, in the UK. There was nothing in those days. And then one day there was uh, there were two main magazines in the UK that, that in, in those days. There was, well, there was a few more, but there was the main ones were like Combat Magazine and there was Martial Arts Illustrated. You also had Fighting, Fighting Arts International by, you know, the, the, the great Terry O'Neill. Um, but I got Combat Magazine and I, I saw a, uh, an interview with, um, with a guy called Bob Spore who was teaching Thai boxing at Birmingham University. So I called Bob got on like a house on fire with Bob. Bob could sell ice to Eskimos. And um, Stevie and I, there was everywhere we went for 20 years, it was Stevie and me. And we went to Bob's class and got, I, I was got completely obsessed with, with Muay Thai. And then I was trying, I was cross training in Muay Thai uh, and Jiu Jitsu for quite a while. And I just got married as well. So that was 1990. So I just got married. And I was pretty much at the house five, six nights a week, which is not great for newlyweds. And um, I just felt like I was going against the grain doing the jiu-jitsu. So I, I, I said my goodbyes to jiu-jitsu and started training with, with Bob pretty much four or five times a week uh, at various locations in Birmingham, learning Muay Thai. And I just loved it. I loved that ability because I was doing jiu-jitsu and I realized that, I, you know, like I said, I could put a throw or do a lock but I couldn't punch my way out of a paper bag. And just, you know, seeing these guys and some of the students there, like, again, another shout out, like guys like Peter Ashford, they were British champion at that time. And they were, they were awesome guys. They, were, they just hit so hard. And I was like, this is more like it. This is more like it. But I was still scared, Joe, because of what happened to me regarding the knife work. And Bob had, done, Bob, had, Bob had done a little bit of a screamer. So he started showing me a little bit of stick work and a little bit of knife work. And, and that's when I started to kind of like research. Again, the geek in me, I don't look like a geek, but the geek in me was like researching blade arts. Um, but yeah, the answer to your question going off on one, the answer to your question was, you know, it, until I started learning a weapons-based art, I was still scared. Mm. And, and, and I guess because, I mean, the mid 80s to early 90s, I mean, our understanding of PTSD and, and, and dealing with trauma was, it's quite immature compared to what we know now. Uh, yeah. And, and how to actually help someone who's been through a trauma like that. Uh, so, so in a way, I guess your martial arts became your therapy, it became a, a way to explore and to demystify yeah. what happened. And, uh, and, I, and I'm sure, I'm sure when you started training the blade arts, there was a lot of uh, flashbacks and memories and and how yeah all that that was the type of attack and all, all that kind of stuff would have would have appeared to absolutely you. petrified considering i'm a, you know the son of an irishman and i like i like a guinness and i like bread and i like potatoes and i quite like a whiskey but whiskey doesn't like me um you know i i couldn't even use a butter knife to butter my bread and i was that scared of knives it really did fuck me up. And you now I've said this time and time again, if I didn't address it, I, I'd have been running away from it my entire life. It was like, I've got to do this. So I started, uh, there was a guy in Nottingham called Martin Smith. Nottingham's about 50 miles from, 60 miles from where I lived. And he was the only person that was actually teaching like Filipino martial arts around that time. So I used to drive up to Nottingham to train with Martin once a week and start you know, learning the, the stick and started learning a little bit of blade. But I'd been reading stuff about Silat and, and I was like, this, 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 there's something about this that, I'm, uh, that was, that just, I had to learn it. And um, I went to a Danny Nasanto seminar in, oh God, 91 in London at Bob Breen's place in in um, Hoxton Square and I saw Daniel Santo do Silat for the first time and I just the way that again that fluid way of moving and I was like wow I've, I've got to learn this 
And then I started to research where the art came from. And it was like Southern Thailand. It was Malaysia, Indonesia, Southern Philippines. So I went back home and I said to my wife, you know, at that time, I, you know, I, we were just moved into our first house. We didn't have any money. Uh, and I said to my wife, I went, can we go to the Far East? And she looked at me and I says, I want to go to Indonesia. And um, bless her, she's been always, she's been like my rock and really supportive. And she went, OK. So we, we, we went to Hong Kong and we went to Singapore. And then we got, I know it's not too far for you Aussies, but we went for a, like a week in Bali. And uh, I, I was the guy that was going around every waiter, <laughs> everybody in the hotel, everywhere that we were going on, you know, shopping to see if anybody could take me to a, a Silat teacher. Uh, ba Bali, just Bali, and Bali, and 91, Bali and 91 wasn't quite the province of Australia that it is now. <laughs> and they just smiled at me. And the only thing I got Silat related was a book on the Chris Dagger by Edward Frey. And I came back really pissed off that I'd gone all that way in search of Silat. All that way to find a guru. And um, I came back to England and uh, with nothing. And then as lucky as I have it, Bob was writing for Combat magazine and we had to go to, uh, we went to a Rick Young seminar. And if you can ever get the chance to get Rick Young on, we'll get Rick Young on. He's the, he's, probably one of the greatest martial artists of, of our time. Um, he's been under Guru Dan and Santo for 40 years now. He's up in Edinburgh and uh, Rick was teaching the seminar. And um, at the seminar, Chris Parker, my teacher, um, went along to say hello to Rick in the, in the break. And Chris had just bought out, there was uh, in Terry O'Neill's fighting arts, there was uh, a Jeff Thompson, um, a video. There was a Rick Young trapping video, and there's a Chris Parker closing the gap. And I remember the, me, me and Steve Maycock, my first jiu jitsu teacher, being around. I'd opened his eyes by this time. He was so blinkered just on jiu jitsu, and then me being all over the place. We went around his house and we watched Jeff's first um, film. We watched uh, Rick's trapping, and we watched um, Chris Parker. And I saw Chris Parker moving it again, it was that fluid motion. And I said to Chris, when I met him at Rick's seminar, I went, is there any chance I could come and train with you? Because I loved your video. And uh, he accepted me as a student. Little did I know that Chris was a Malaysian Silat teacher. <laughs> right, right in your backyard as opposed to all the way across the world. Absolutely. So I went all the way to Indonesia to find the guru and found him up the road. And uh, here's, a, here's a quick one for you regarding Rick Young. Um, Rick, Rick Young's a hero of mine. He was like the, the king of cross training in the UK, a massive pioneer. And I used to host Rick several times a year to do seminars. I didn't, I didn't have a club or anything. I used to just host him and get people in the Nars Arts community in Birmingham to, to attend. And um, I used to get um, uh, Jeff Thompson and Rick were, were, were quite friendly. And because I lived literally five minutes from Birmingham airport. I'd fly Rick down from, from Edinburgh to Birmingham. And uh, Jeff used to come to my house, into my garage uh, way back in the day. And uh, about 94, 95, and start doing, having some private lessons with, with Rick in my garage. Wow. So uh, that was, that was, that, that was pretty cool. You've had royalty in your garage, that's nice. I've had martial arts royalty in my garage, mate. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, that's, and, and that's how the, the Silat thing started by going to a Ricky Young seminar. Chris being there to say hi, me going up saying, I loved your video. And um, here I am 20, 28 years later, still a student of, uh, of Guru Tua Chris. Wow. So, I mean, the, the, area, the way I first heard about you years ago, uh, and it probably would have been through a martial arts magazine uh, or, or potentially, potentially the internet, but uh, was the approach. So talk us through the, what is the approach for those who have never heard of it? Uh, and and what, was the, what was the creation process? What, what was the origin story? Oh, mate, if I, if I still would have had to think about a name for it, it wouldn't have been the approach. It was a name that my teacher gave it. 
I've been obsessed with weaponry the past 30 years. Used to do a lot of Filipino dog brother style, full contact stick fighting, smashing the crap out of each other. So he's been, he's been used to throwing lots of big, heavy forehands and backhands. Um, and there was one evening I was teaching my, my, my Thai class and I stopped the class and I said, guys, I went, I know, we're not, I know, the, I said, I know this is not Thai related. I said, but I want to show you this. I, I, I don't know to this day why I stopped the class, Joe. I said, I want to show you this. And I started showing these big forehand backhand movements. Again, if you've, you know, in, in any art, you know, with a blade or a stick, you've got a forehand backhand movement. So, you know, I've not reinvented the wheel. But it was done with that mindset to smash whatever was in the way. And I saw the last half an hour of my Thai class, I had all my Thai guys, you know, attacking each other with jab crosses and everything else. And they were doing these big forehand backhand movements. Anyway, cut a long story short, I went to see Chris on Sunday, my teacher, told him about what happened in the Thai class. And he'd never been one for giving me compliments. And he went, that's fucking brilliant. He went, Eddie Quinn's the approach. And I've been one of those guys, like I've said, I've always struggled with confidence. Not you wouldn't notice when you've seen me teach, but I'm not the most confident of people. And I've always told myself that I can't do it. You know, you've always got the good one and the bad one, or yes, you can, no, you can't. I've, and loads of times I've listened to the one who's told me I'm crap. Well, anyway, for some reason, I just told that one on my shoulder to go and do, do one, go fuck yourself. And I like the idea. Anyway, one of my uh, CELAP, um training partners, John, he just filmed the Danny Nasanto uh, definitive collection in Edinburgh for Rick. And he had all the cameras and he said, come to my basement and we'll film it. Um, and what happened was we'd done a, we'd done a, we, we, we'd done like a, what's the word? We'd done like a trial. Chris said to me, get, get Richie Granham from Street Fight Secrets. He went to come and film you. So we, we hired this little studio and I was just getting all this stuff out of me. And he filmed it and I can still picture Rich now. He had the camera and I could see him going, this. you could see him doing this so we, it was a pilot that's a word a pilot and we got the we got the material back i went to chris's we watched it and he went this is really good you need to get filmed properly john who had the cameras went to his basement and we filmed uh volume one the entry system power development and multiple strikes and i put an advert in martial arts illustrated magazine and for DVDs in those days. And I was getting orders. And I was like, fuck, people are buying my stuff. And I was getting more orders and from all over the place, Australia or Thailand, America, Canada, South Africa, all over the world. And then I started getting invites to go and teach seminars to Australia, to Far East, to the Middle East, to America, to all over Europe. And I was like, wow, things like this don't happen to me. You know, I was in my, I was in my early 40s then. And it just went from strength to strength. And we started putting together some, like some, some approach instructor courses. And I, and I went from being probably just a, a local martial arts teacher where everybody knew was the local martial artist to someone who's, who, who really upped his profile by telling that negativity to go and do one and taking some action. And um, it's pretty much changed my life, if I'm honest with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy story to go from uh, uh, a kid just trying to learn a bit of martial arts as a way of getting over a trauma to you know, th 30 years later being interviewed as a, as a legend of combat sports or a, a legend well, of martial arts. On a, on a podcast i mean and i know i know you don't use that term to describe yourself but i'll, I'll describe you that way That's uh cool. and i mean to to be mentioned in the same conversation i mean jeff thompson mentioned you to me uh oh, nice. and lee morrison mentioned you and so I mean, the, the, these are 
luminaries uh, of of the field that uh, that obviously hold, hold you in high regard. So uh, you, I, I know it's it's against your personality to big note yourself, but uh, I'll I'll do it for you. Uh, I'm curious as we uh, one of the things that, that that has been brought up by several people that have requested to have you on the show, especially those that have that have hosted you, and and this this is the feedback that I get not just from martial arts practitioners that have learned from you but from other instructors that have learned from you and i always find that instructor development piece really interesting because you and i are both i'm sure know many martial artists who are fantastic martial artists but just can't teach for the life of them or they can't they can't sustain they can't sustain a club they can't nurture someone's development over an extended period of time and and sometimes that seminar circuit is a little bit artificial because you've only got to entertain someone for a couple of hours and then you never see them again, which is completely different to taking someone from being a, a skinny, uncoordinated teenager to someone who's quite capable with over a period of years. Yeah. And, uh, I, I'm curious to, I, I guess, see, see if you have any insights for instructors about nurturing long-term development uh, in students. But, but also the other thing that I've heard a lot about you is that you are very... Um, adamant about that, that training should be fun and it, it should be that, that is a positive influence on your life not something that's negative and scary and stressful all the time so I just want to give you a bit of a floor to unpack some of that um when I was at school I got bullied and to the point where I couldn't stay in the playground my mom used to walk two miles to the school take me to the local park have a picnic in the park and then go back to class this was as an infant junior and I hated school from the day that I started to the day I left when I was 16 with no education got a YTS youth training scheme it was a 25 pounds a week as a as a basically slave labor uh, and I didn't get inspired by one teacher uh, which is I, maybe it's I, maybe it's a two-way thing. Maybe I didn't want to be inspired. Maybe I just didn't like school. But I never had any teacher touch me on the shoulder, give me a push, and say, "Go on, you can do this." And like I said to you, that if it wasn't for being stabbed, and I'd never have taken up martial arts. And then when I started teaching in 1998, so I've been training for since 85, 86. So I started training teaching towards the end of 1998, I always vowed that, especially when I started teaching kids, that I would try to be the person that I needed when I was a child. And Jake, my son's 25 now, he was born in 1996. I started teaching kids at his school and I went, from teaching no children to literally teaching hundreds of kids at different after school clubs in my area uh, from that day on. And I think I've taught literally thousands and thousands of children. And um, it's something that I'm very proud of um, because I think we all need someone that's going to be just tell us that go on you'll be okay have a go and that's probably one of the reasons why I'm so I'm passionate about what I do you know I nearly died I, I teach from a different place uh, I'm a kid from the streets I know bullshit when I see I, I pinched this off Paul Vunak years and years ago we all pinch off everyone don't we and he said he sees martial arts in two different categories self-perfection self-preservation self-perfection to do the art because you love the art no matter what that art is that art is self-preservation is to get the job done and get home to your family so of course through what happened to me and to my family I think I just teach from a different place. It's like a the 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 Eddie Quinn that people see outside the martial arts is a very very quiet introvert. I'm the kind of guy that 
sat on his own in a pub, having a pint, reading a book, where the, the landlord will go, on your own tonight, Ed? And I'll, and I'll go, yeah, the other lads can make it tonight, John. Not realising that I'm the, the, my little happy place. Um, so, you know, I'm quite happy being in that little world. I've lost my train of thought now, uh, Joe. Yeah, no, you, you were just talking about um, you know, being that positive influence and um, I guess nurturing the, those people just need a little bit of a pat on the back and say, you'll be, you'll be okay, you know, um, keep going. Yeah, absolutely. So because of my experiences, and I don't want people to go through what I, that, that's probably not the nail on the head, really. You probably got it out of me. I don't want people to go through what I went through. And yeah, I think you also got to realize that because of what, you know, martial arts got this macho image, you don't know what shit. Steve Maycock didn't know what shit had happened to me before I walked through his door. I've been to some martial arts schools in the past where they've not made you welcome. He made me feel welcome. I remember when I first went to Thailand, I was shitting myself. And the, 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 one of the trainers there, he just smiled at me, put his arm around me, went, come on, you're with me. He couldn't speak hardly any English. I couldn't speak Thai. But just that smile and just that, that arm around you and just say, come on, I'll look after you. Uh, it, it goes a long way. So you, we don't realise just what shit has happened in people's lives for them to come and want to come into your, your class. And I, I, want, I, I don't want people to have to go through what I went through. Yeah, and I, I think sometimes we, we don't realise what a big step it is for people to even come in for the first it's, time. It's huge. Uh, they're, they're, I mean, someone might have been agonising over this decision for months or years before they've walked in. And if the first impression they have is this is terrifying uh, and no one wants me here uh, and I'm, and I'm going to have to fight for survival just to come, why would I pay money yeah. for that? Yeah. Like, well, I mean, it's it, not everyone is a super motivated, ready for the hardship. Like, I mean, some people are just like, it, it was everything they could just to get out of the car in the car mm -hmm. park. Uh, and, and they need to be nurtured from that point forward. And, and as you say, the hardest thing about being an instructor is that, Sometimes you'll get the hard charging, you know, 20 year old kid who just wants to train hard and be a world champion and whatever. Right? Uh, and then sometimes you're going to get a, a more damaged person who, who needs a longer mm -hmm. uh, process to, to mm -hmm. open up and, and then they may become a champion themselves, but it's probably not what they're looking mm -hmm. at right now. Uh, one of my frustrations when I, so I, my background is I started off in combat sports and then went into you know, reality-based self-defense and, uh, uh, became an instructor under Richard Dimitri. And when I started teaching Senshido classes or, or, or RBSD classes, uh, I was getting a lot of students that had this obsession with worst case scenario violence, which we all know is important. But when you're, you're dwelling on it and thinking everybody around every corner is going to do this, it's, it became such a negative environment. Yeah. And I was like, guys, you need to go do something else. Like there's, you, you can't focus on this. Let's work on skill development. Let's yeah. not worry about scenario training every single time because you're living in this state of perpetual anxiety and stress and uh, you, you'll manifest this because you're, because you're constantly thinking about yeah. it. It's almost like you're looking for a way to get stabbed yeah. so that you can see if this stuff works. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it just relax, be a better person. And it won't happen to you as much. Ooh. So it's that, I think it's that thing again is like, you know, why, why do you, you know, Rick Young said this God 25 years ago to me. Why do you, you know, why do people train? Why are you training? What are the reasons why you want to train? You know, for me, I like, I like the broad spectrum of, of learning a traditional art, the CLAT. I do a sport martial art with the tie. And then with the approach, I just keep my hand in on my kind of like, I don't even, I don't even like the word i just see myself as i just see myself as a martial artist and a martial arts teacher i don't see me as a combative teacher or a reality-based teacher or a thai boxing teacher or a kid's teacher i'm a martial artist that's what i am that's what i am and i, and I think if 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 you if you just like combat 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 you know reality 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 uh, i think it can send you a little bit paranoid i think we need to have that unless it's your job unless it's your job Oh, absolutely. But, 
if, you, if you've got a job that exposes you to those threats all the time, then you better take it seriously. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but but I, I, I believe in that whole, the whole thing of it, of, of, of being a martial arts teacher from a traditional to a sport. And let's face it, you know, I've been training for 35 years. If I can't handle myself for the decade on the street now, after all these years, then I've been doing something wrong. And some people still continue to train for that decade on the streets. Well, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, my, one of my good friends, Jim Armstrong here in, here in Melbourne, uh, he, he, he said uh, self-defense 101 is don't be such a dickhead. Uh, and that's, that's pretty yeah, well, much yeah. that. <laughs> if we could just instill that in uh, in every twenty something male, uh, we'd probably have a lot less street violence. It's uh, yeah, you know, yeah. We, the situations we put ourselves in uh, through ego or through you know uh, just not realizing that we might be the bad guy in that particular situation. And uh, and yeah, one of the things that, that I preach all the time, and when I'm teaching seminars, is that everybody thinks they're the everyone thinks they're the good guy. Everyone mm -hmm. thinks what they're doing is is justified and right and right behavior is subjective. So sometimes we have to put ourselves in the, in the other person's shoes and, and go, how, how do I be less antagonistic? You know, like, is yes. there a way out of this? Or I don't know what's going on in that person's life. I don't, I don't know that, uh, you know, what, that when I'm dealing with them is that the worst possible day of their life that I could be crossing paths with them. And, uh, yeah. and maybe, maybe they need a little bit of grace instead of a punch in the face. It's, uh, just be nice. Just be nice until it's time not to be nice. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. That's true though. Absolutely. All right, Eddie, we're coming up on time, mate. Uh, for, for those that want to learn more about you, if they want to book you, they want to train with you, where's the best place they can go to, to reach out to you? Probably the best place to get me is uh, via Facebook, I think, just Eddie Quinn. Um, you and I are mutual friends, so they can hopefully check you through there. I, I have got an approach website, but it needs a little bit of work doing to it. I have got some online courses as well that people can, can check out. Um, but if anybody wants to contact me, better off get me uh via facebook i have got an instagram account as well which i don't use i'm not the best on social media facebook is, seems to be the the one that i can navigate around um but um yeah if anybody wants me uh facebook is the one to, to get me on awesome thank you very much eddie it's been it's been a pleasure talking to you uh thank I'm you very much that was that went really quick uh, it, it did mate it did and I, and I love just sitting back and listening to your story because it's people's personal stories are so much more important than what's in the textbook. And, uh, and I, I just appreciate your openness and your honesty. And, and I, I can tell just, I mean, if, you, if you're listening to the audio of this and you can't see the video, I mean, I, I hope it comes through in the, in the voice, but I mean, Eddie is a genuine article. Uh, the warmth and the, the genuine love he has for this is, is so apparent to me as, as we're, as we're chatting over zoom currently. Uh, and I, I just encourage you if you if you have the opportunity to train with him, go out and do it. I'll definitely be doing that the next time he's in, he's in this country or I'm in the UK whenever we're allowed to do those sort of things again. Uh, but uh, highly recommend it. Everyone I know that's trained with Eddie has come back with great reports, so uh, I encourage you to look into that. Eddie, you got to stick around and you're going to do some uh, bonus questions with us in just a second. But for those that are okay. leaving, yeah, wonderful. Uh, Joe, thank you for me. Really appreciate it. Sorry for losing my train of thought there, and uh, it's quite it, it's it's quite i wouldn't say stressful but when you kind of like reminisce you start to lose your train of thought and it's um you, you sometimes find yourself wandering so <laughs> i do apologize there and uh, and I, I hope that it's been a bit of an inspiration for people not to give in and you can be at death's door and you can still fight back and you can make something of yourself and you can also tell that person on your shoulder that tells you you're no good to go and fuck themselves and listen to the one who says you can reach for the stars nice i love it what a great note to end it on thank you very much mr eddie quinn thanks joe all right thank you very much to mr eddie quinn it was a pleasure to chat with him uh if you're watching this on video you will see him just in the the non-verbals man eddie is such a lovely guy He's such a lovely lovely guy he's got a real heart for this he's got a passion for this and it's always great to share some time with people that that uh, share the same passion and uh, and we do so uh, I, th I thoroughly enjoyed it if you're listening on the audio hopefully it still came through on the audio i'm sure it did uh but please support eddie in uh, any chance you get to go train with him make sure you go do it he's a he's a wonderful guy and a fantastic instructor 
All right, that concludes the UK invasion. We've had a run of UK-based guests. Uh, next week, we're going back over to the US. I'm talking to Mr. Michael Julian from a live active shooter uh, training, and uh, we'll be talking about active shooter situations and uh, how we stay safe in those environments. That's it for this week. Until next week, I'll talk to you next time.